This is uh, English, though. Yeah. But this is a Chinese story. Everyone likes it, Chinese, ma. Funny, when you English. Okay. Ah, uh, Chang Dao Ling. This is a story about Chang Dao Ling. Chang Dao Ling. Ah. It's a uh, very, very tall, 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 and very uh, vigorous guy. Yeah. His eyebrow is very, very bushy. Yeah. He's about uh, seven feet tall over. Woo. And he has a very large and round forehead. Yeah. Chang Tao Ling is one of the, the teacher of the China a uh, long, long time ago. Yeah. In uh, Taoism. Mm. Now, on the right foot, he has seven black dots that are uh, connected together. It looks like uh, the, uh, the Big Dipper, you know, uh, seven stars in the sky. Yeah. He has a very powerful and long, long arms that go all the way over his knees. And his knees is, uh, you know, all down there. Yeah? And his arms go all over down there, all over the knees. Wow. And he walk with tiger-like powers. Yeah, very strong and very fast, like a flying dragon. Right. Before he was conceived, uh, the mother of Chan Tao Ling dreamed that she saw a giant descending from the North Star. So the Lord of the North Star came to her and gave her a flower. When she awoke the next morning, she smelled still the fragrance in her room. Yeah. And discovered that she has conceived a child. Throughout the ten months of her pregnancy, the fragrance always lingering around her as long as she has the baby in the womb. Okay. When Chang Taoling was born, <laughs> a yellow cloud covered the house and purple mist hovered about his mother's bedroom. Yeah. When he came out of his mother's womb, Music and fragrance filled the air, and the room was flooded with bright light that matched the brilliance of the sun and the moon together. I mean, the light is as bright as the sun and the moon combined, yes. So Chang Tao Ling was exceptionally intelligent. At seven, he understood the teaching of Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, by twelve, he had mastered the I Ching and the classics of divination. As a young man, Tao Ling served his community as a provincial <laughs> administrator, but he continued to study the art of the Tao. I don't think it's the art, it's the teaching, no. He continued to uh, study Taoism. Study, in this sense, doesn't mean that he read books, huh? Hmm. Study means practice, in this sense. Uh, he must have, like, a teacher, enlightened teacher in, in the a Tao path who taught him the uh, method of enlightenment. So, this is uh, mostly when an enlightened master was born in the world. It's similar like that, huh? There are some signs, you know, the light all over the house, or uh, maybe the seven lotus, you know, a blooming, something like that, yes. Or maybe the seven lotus wasn't uh, manifesting on the earth for the Buddha to walk on, but it could have been in the vision, you know, in his mother's vision, or someone who is in attendance uh, of his mother's labor day. And this is the day that she gave birth to Sekamoni Buddha. Similar, when Jesus was born, there were the big star, yeah, that uh, guiding the three saints 
came to visit Jesus. Remember? Yeah. So, mostly there are signs. Yeah, when a great enlightened master came to earth, there are signs like that. Yeah? Okay. My different signs is not necessarily the same signs all the time. Mm. But there's something special, yes, something uh, uh, very elevating, yeah. not just for show, something that makes people feel happy, feel uh, elated and enlightened. It's not because it's a sign of heaven or not because the Master so show off. It's just a natural thing. When the light being came into the world, they are accompanied by lights, yeah, by flower, by a special fragrance or music, yes? It's not necessarily obvious to everybody who, who are in the house at that time, but maybe just obvious to some, yeah? Okay? The people who are, uh, are endowed with a spiritual uh, faculty or who are probably practicing and who are already enlightened somehow, maybe. Well, no, not necessary. Sometimes not. <laughs> like in your case, Sometimes you practice a lot, you meditate a lot, and you're waiting for a master to come, and she don't come. <laughs> and she come to your neighbor <laughs> and tell your neighbor, wow, well, it's so difficult to get through my disciples' minds. Oh, please come and tell her <laughs> a message, yes? Or maybe your, your little kid, yeah, it's only half initiated, yeah, but saw Master every day, come play with her, tell her things, and you sitting there next to her drooling and waiting and don't see nothing. <laughs> because your mind is so full of unnecessary stuff that Master had uh, no room to walk in to tell you things. Yeah, it happened all the time, right? Yes. Yeah, you know that already, yes. I only ask you so that, you know, you have to go firm with me, otherwise... Uh, you think I'm telling the story, or some people who don't have this experience think that I'm making it up. Did I make it up? No. Yeah, good. <laughs> it's true like that, huh? And sometimes the master comes to the grocery store owner <laughs> because you go there shopping every day, <laughs> and you go home and you don't see nothing. You don't hear master talk, so I had to go and talk to the shop owner who didn't expect anything, and then who got it and then tell you, huh? And then you believe more, yeah. And sometimes you see the master and you think you imagine, yeah? Uh, is it true or not? But the grocery store who has never met master before, who could not imagine anything, and he has nothing to gain from me, when he tells you, then you know, oh, that's correct, <laughs> something like that. Or tell your family member, then they believe even more, yeah? If you tell your family member, sometimes your family member do not believe if they don't practice the Kuan Yin method. So sometimes it takes stranger to tell people about the message. Yeah? Okay? Right. How? <laughs> ah, okay. Now we're going to go back. We're going to go back to the Chang Okay. Chang Dao Ling was uh, very exceptional, eh? Hmm intelligent, good manner, and understood everything as the young age already. So now one day, while he was meditating, yeah, in his retreat, I told you, I told you before, uh, I did not read this, this uh, part yet, you see? I told you, uh, he continued to study Taoism. Doesn't mean he read books from Taoism, but he truly studied with a master and practiced meditation to realize the Tao, not to recite <laughs> the description of the Tao, but to realize, to be enlightened in the Tao uh, power. Okay, now, so one day, you see, Gordon, naturally now look at this. One day while he was meditating in, in his retreat, I did not read the whole story. Eh? Today I didn't have time. I read just a little bit in the front, and then I thought it's okay, yeah? So now I'm surprised that they even mentioned what I just told you <laughs> in the front. While he was meditating in his retreat, a white tiger came to his side. In its mouth was a scroll of sacred scripture. Chang Taoling knew that it was time for him to leave the world of politics 
to pursue the Tao. So he resigned his position eh? uh, as a government administrator and he became a hermit in the mountains. When the emperor heard about Chang Taoling's retirement, he offered him the title of imperial teacher and begged him to return to the government service. Wow, imperial teacher, the teacher of the king, the teacher of the royal household. Wow. When he forsake everything, he got even a better position. Don't try, huh? <laughs> Don't try just for that, huh? <laughs> Don't try to, to, to give up your secretary post in the village uh, chief office and then hoping for become prime minister or something, huh? And say, Master, read the story. It inspired me. <laughs> but the emperor, the king, offered him three times. Three times, Chang Taoling refused. Now, because everybody already know at that time where he uh, meditate on retreat, so he knew that he's not going to have peace staying in that area. So he left and moved to a very, very remote mountainous region of Sichuan. Okay. Over there, the scenery is very, very beautiful and celestial-like. There was a stream that run very deep and crystal uh, water, and the waterfalls cascaded down a beautiful... Uh, precipitous cliffs. Wow, I wouldn't mind going there. He selected a cave where he could meditate well, learn the art of immortality, and attain the Tao. Ah, immortality. So if we go back there, maybe we still can find him? <laughs> maybe he's still there, who knows? Okay, let's go and find him, eh? <laughs> okay, here, what does it mean, immortality? Anybody knows? <laughs> He's still there because he learned the art of immortality. Is he still there in that cave of somewhere in China, perhaps? Or maybe he immigrated to the United States, who knows? But is he still in the world? All right. So, what is the art of immortality? Yeah? It's the art of learning to know that we are never born and we will be never dead. Yeah? No death, no birth. Because we became one with all things. We became one with the Creator, yeah, if the creative force in the universe. Okay, now, uh, is it possible to also learn to live forever or very long time? Yeah, for many hundred years or even many thousands of years, it's possible like that. Uh, learning the art of uh, not uh, physically dying is also possible. It just in this uh, story, it means that he has learned not to fear death, yeah? He has learned to transcend life and death, and he has learned to uh, become um, one with the uh, level that people realize that there's no birth, no death, and there's no body to begin with. That is the art of immortality. It's not meaning only that uh, maybe he lives forever, it's not necessary even to live forever in the physical world because we live forever anyway. The physical body is there just for some purposes and it's an illusion. And when we practice meditation, and during meditation time, sometimes we realize it is like that, that we don't really have a body. But then when we have the, still the uh, karmic, uh, give and take in this world, then we still need the body. So we came back for a while, and then we go back to heaven and come back to the body and etc., etc. 
And if you want to live forever, it's also possible. It's just not very necessary. If we want to live long or live forever, we could uh, uh, stay between the border of astral level and physical level. I mean, back and forth, back and forth, we jump uh, like a border, you know? Uh, okay. I don't know how to explain this. There is a threshold between the astral level, which is invisible body. Yeah, after you so-called die, your physical body disintegrate, but you have another body. It look exactly like your body right now. It's just uh, more beautiful, yeah, more useful, and doesn't go old, yes, and perfect condition. For example, uh, you you lost your arm, one arm here, yeah, or your nose is a, a sweet tit on one side like that, huh? Yeah. But after you leave this physical body, uh, you have the same arm like before. Your nose is straight in uh, in, the, in the middle here, yeah, and uh, your whole body is perfect, uh, just like uh, the day you were born. Huh? Yes. Well, some people are born with defect, but what I mean is, when you were born perfect, then uh, when you leave the physical body and enter the astral body, your body is perfect and you will not feel immediately the difference between your astral body and the physical body that you have left behind, except that you saw that, hey, how come it looked like me laying in there and who are me here, you know? The people who do not practice the, the Tao, yeah, the path of enlightenment, uh, like, for example, Kuan Yin Method, when they die, uh, some of them get very confused thinking, oh, maybe they are still alive, I mean, still in physical body. That's why some ghosts, so-called ghosts, linger uh, next to the physical body or, or inside the house that they used to live, trying to get back the possession of whatever they have left, you know, like in the house, yeah? So sometimes if somebody go in their house and use their stuff, you know, and they get angry, sometimes they throw tantrum, and if they're strong enough, they even manifest themselves into... Uh, physical body for a few seconds or a few minutes and scaring the whole household, you know, and everybody goes screaming out, ah, there's a ghost, there's a ghost. <laughs> yeah, and that happens, okay? That happens. Uh, or they came back and, you know, uh, even though they cannot manifest into a visible uh, body, they, they would make trouble, you know? They try to throw out things in the house or rattle the doors or... Uh, moving the chairs and uh, breaking the furniture and the bowl and the plates and all that, or uh, rattling the cooking pot and all that, make a lot of noise and scare people. Yes. Because they are still very confused. How come nobody hear them? How come nobody talk to them? No, how, come, how come his wife is already kissing somebody else? Yeah, this is uh, terrible <laughs> for him, yeah? Okay, and because they don't have the physical body anymore, they are uh, very uh, sensitive to all the feelings of the people around them. They can travel fast from one uh, city to the next, you know, in a few seconds, or in no time at all. And for them, space and time means nothing much. So they can appear anywhere very quickly. And also, they can see everything, you see? They can feel everything. Like if you're crying for them, they feel very sorrowful, yeah? For example, if the husband just died and the whole house is still crying uh, for him, yeah? The wife or the children uh, and all that, they're crying or even not crying. Uh, their heart feel well, broken because husband just died, father just died. And this uh, non-practitioner soul will hang around them and trying to hug them, comfort them, and talk to them, saying, I'm still here, I'm still here. But uh, the family member cannot hear them. Well, some people hear, yes, yeah? some family member can see them. Uh, I mean, this is rare, yeah, it's rare, but it happened. So they were very, very uh, frustrated and confused. So they just uh, feel very, very sad and suffering, and they don't understand what's going on. 
because they still feel like when they were still in the physical body and they don't understand why everything so changed. And nobody would talk to them and nobody would even recognize they're standing nearby or hugging them. Just ignore them completely like that. For them, it is very confusing and frustrating. Uh, so most people, when they talk about immortality, they think in that way. They think, okay, I live forever in this physical body. But it's not always the case, yes? Uh, we, the practitioner, if we have to go, we go, yeah? We have seen many better uh, planets, yeah? Better level of heaven uh, during meditation. We wish to leave this physical body and go there as soon as possible. So it's no, no problem to us. We all prepare, yeah? And we will not linger to this uh, physical uh, a planet. If we are a high-level practitioners, we know there are better places to go. Fine. Mm. Some people are not yet uh, on a high level. Of course, they still are very attached to this physical planet. But uh, the people who do not practice, you know, when they die, they're confused like that. Yeah? Okay. Now, the person who refused the emperor order at that time is a very daring person because the emperor could chop your head off for disobeying the emperor or uh, disrespect to the emperor's order. Wow! You could even get all your three generation head chopped off for being disrespectful to the emperor. But this guy, he's so brave. Maybe he didn't have any family member anymore anyway. <laughs> And also maybe he knew it, yeah? And even he knew the emperor respectful to him and might not do the chopping head stuff, stuff to him and his family members, but he still run away to another place. Yes, who knows? You know, it's safer to, <laughs> to run away from secular power, you know? From the beginning of the time, we always have problem hmm? with the, uh, the power of authority. Uh, anything that is not conformed to the social tradition or religious belief at that time uh, would incur problem yeah, for the person who practices it. Yes. So he ran away somewhere else and there he found a beautiful scenery place to stay and practice. And then he attained the Tao. What does it mean attaining the Tao? Good girl. Mm. <laughs> okay, achieve enlightenment. Good, good. Right. So he had attained a great part of enlightenment, I guess. Yeah? Not just enlightenment, but a great part of it. The great part of wisdom. Okay, now, Tao Ling stay in uh, his uh, cave, you know, in this mountain that he had chosen for many years until one day he heard the cry of a white crane. He knew it was a sign that he would attain enlightenment soon. Yeah, he mean a greater enlightenment, huh? Yeah, or maybe perfect enlightenment. What meaning when he hear the uh, cry of the crane mean his uh, enlightenment will come to him soon? What does that mean? Is that the real crane that cry? No. What is it? Inside. Ah, the inside sound. It's similar to the sound of the crane. Remember the sound I told you? Many sounds that uh, uh, indicate uh, enlightenment? Yeah, okay. So he heard one of these sounds and he knew that he's getting uh, more enlightenment now. Or maybe at that time he began to get enlightenment, okay? Beginning, all right. The sound of the crane is not the highest, is it? Is it? Okay. So now a year later, when he was stoking the fires of his furnace to uh, incubate the dragon tire elixir, the red shaft of light appeared and illuminated his cave. Ah, oh, this is another mystery. How can you keep uh, stoking the fire and then the shaft of uh, a light 
would appear, just a small red shaft of light would illuminate your cave. What does that mean again? The inside light. The inside light, yes. In the old time, you know, people say something like that. You know, like in India, uh, the master likened the elixir of enlightenment to a cup filled with intoxicant wine from the divine. Yeah, okay, fill my cup with the uh, intoxicated elixir. It doesn't mean the real cup, yeah? And it doesn't mean a physical elixir. It means the inner realization of blissfulness. Okay, good, good. Right. <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, they are talking in mystery here, but we understand, right? Because we practice the same method or else nobody would understand this. They would think it's a physical fire that he was uh, playing with. Yes. And they would think that the red shaft of light, uh, just a small red shaft of light, would illuminate the whole cave. This is nonsensical, physically speaking. All right. So another year went by, and a white tiger and a green dragon came into the cave and sat by the side of the cauldron to protect the elixir. Huh. So people would think he has a pot where he was cooking the elixir for all these years. And the white tiger and the green dragon <laughs> did really come sit next to the pot of elixir, you know, a potion <laughs> pot and guard it. So up to present times, even when I was younger, I always heard something like, okay, the Taoist people they cook the elixir potion in a pot, <laughs> and then they can attain immortality. It's always like that. How about you? Did you hear the same stuff? Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, this is a great misunderstanding. <laughs> They're talking in a parable, you know, and only they themselves understand it. Because in the old time, if you ever uh, leak out that you are a Taoist, a practitioner, and you are enlightened and this and that, then maybe you get your head chopped off. Or you get, uh, you know, harm in some way. You know, many masters have died, tragically, yeah? Because they dare to say that they know the Tao, that they see the Tao, or they see God, or they see the inner realms of heaven. Even if they tell the truth, the society, most of whom do not understand what they're talking about, and most of whom cling to the uh, established order of religion, would never believe it, yeah? So they accuse them of witchcraft, of black magic uh, practitioner, of uh, harmful devil worshiper, whatever, because they cannot believe such thing can happen, you know? They would believe that these kind of people they are just uh, cheating, you know, or they try to get money by boasting that they are enlightened, something like that, and they are harmful to the innocent <laughs> and the uh, light-hearted believer and so on and so on and so forth. And also the uh, established order of religion are also fearful, fearful that all their followers will come and follow this enlightened person, which has already happened at that time, or whoever. The master at that time would attract the great crowd of all different faiths and different religious order come to their side and practice the true religious uh, enlightenment, yeah? The knowing from within, the kingdom of God inside, the Buddha nature in you. So anyway, so they have to say that, okay, I'm still cooking, <laughs> I am still brewing my pot of elixir, and now the tiger and dragon came and protect uh, my cauldron of elixir. Then people understand that, okay, they are stabilized now in their practice, and they did not lose their level. Because sometimes you could, like, have a glimpse of a higher level, but you lost it next day, and you come up and you lost it. And one day when you stabilize yourself in one level, no matter what level that is that I have told you at the time of initiation, uh, when you are stabilized on that level, and then you can move to the next soon. You see what I mean? So the dragon on one side and the tiger on the other side, that means 
okay, I'm stabilized. Yeah, I'm cool now. Yeah, and I will continue further. Or maybe uh, he meant that uh, this person is already completely enlightened, attained the fifth level already, and he knew it already. But he only can tell it to his master, yeah? Or maybe in the gathering of a close disciple, he tell his master, then everybody knows that he attained the Tao. He attained the, the fifth level, the highest level that the human being can attain. So, so now, uh, finally, another three years passed, and uh, since uh, he heard the, the voice of the white crane, the elixir was completed, and he became an immortal. Ah, yeah, this is what it is, of course, yeah? <laughs> he became completely enlightened, right? Right now, completely enlightened. So that's what it means. An immortal, meaning that he is going to be no born, no death again. Yeah, he's, he's liberated forever from the cycle of physical birth and physical death. Yes, he attained the fifth level of consciousness, the highest that we can attain as a human being. Okay, yes, completely free from everything from ego, from karma, from the circle of reincarnation, the birth and death, suffering, etc., etc. Completely free from the karmic uh, retribution and uh, power to drag you back down into this physical world again. So uh, he has a choice whether to be reborn here or not reborn here. And if he is reborn here again, that means it's just to help others. Yeah, He's not forced to be reborn as per bad karmic retribution. That means truly immortal. Immortal doesn't mean you keep this physical body forever. Well, you could, as I told you already, if you stay between the threshold of the astral world and the physical world, you come back and forth a little bit, you know? Yes. Then you cannot stay forever in the physical world, but you can also not stay always in the astral world. You have to be like a, a rope walker, you know, balancing it. You know, it's like in some country, there's a border in between, yeah, and there's a big, long border, <laughs> a room, um, area, yeah, and you stand in between that, and you can just uh, now and again uh, jump to Canada, jump to America, <laughs> jump to Mexico, jump back and forth like that, yeah, and you come back and forth all the time already, and uh, you are clean and clear, and the border police will just let you go, and uh, no problem at all, and you, you can also neither be Mexican nor American, you just uh, be free, yes, like that, you can come and go to America, come and go to Mexico, understand now? Mm? Yeah? Okay. If you want to keep this uh, rotten physical body, be welcome. Just hang around in between the astral and the physical level. No? Oh, why not? It's fun. <laughs> you can come back see me all the time and eat a lot of stuff in the kitchen. <laughs> I remember last night you you rather you get up and eat the last supper, huh? Uh, of the day only, yeah. Okay. It's nice to have a supper, huh? At night, huh? Anybody want to be breatharian? No? Why not? The pudding tastes good? Okay. <laughs> All right. Eat a little less, huh? I mean, enough to survive, okay? Don't starve yourself, but don't stuff yourself too much. I cannot meditate very well, yeah. All right. Now we continue. Hmm with the immortality of uh, Chang Taoling. Hmm. He left his cave and traveled throughout the river valleys and mountains of Sichuan. On one of his journeys, he met Lao Tzu, ah, who taught him how to fly to the stars and tunnel under the earth. Oh, they just talk like that. <laughs> now they make us all confused, as if we could do that physically. Now, there may be some magical uh, way that you can do that too, but I doubt it if Lao Tzu would have taught him to fly to the star and dig a tunnel, I mean, um, 
啊，唐云驾雾啦，哈、啊、，OK means the person who could fly up to the sky anytime he wants and uh, uh, walk under the ground, under the soil anytime he wants, disappearing anytime he wants. I doubt it very much that Lao Tzu would have taught him this kind of magical power. Uh, do you know why I doubt it? So simple. Okay. Do you remember why Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching? I gave you a hint. Why he wrote the Tao Te Ching? One of the uh, border police chief, you know, get hold of him and didn't let him go until he wrote down something. Is that correct? Yeah. Ah, you remember now? <laughs> How wonderful! Such a good memory you have. Hmm. I read that when I was seven, and I still remember up to now. Okay, now. So suppose Lao Tzu knows the art of truly physically flying. You know, disappear into the star, or walking under. The soil, you know, disappear into the into the ground. Then he would have escaped. <laughs> he wanted to to go away, and that guy stopped him and say, "You cannot go until you write me something." So Lao Tzu had to stay there, a prisoner, and brought the Tao Te Ching, finished, and then the guy let him go. Do you understand me? Yes. Ah, so what does it mean now? Fly into the stars and. Walk under uh, the earth anytime. It doesn't mean your physical body can do that, correct? So what does it mean? We could do that, right? When we meditate, we left the physical body. Sometimes we even see our physical body sitting there, yeah. And then we fly up to wherever the master takes us, yeah. And then even master sometimes take you, you know, go down under the, under the the earth, or go to hell, visit hell people to help somebody and to show you because you want to go to hell, <laughs> not because you like hell, but you want to prove that hell exists. Okay, so sometimes master even take you there, and then you are crying to go back quick, yeah. <laughs> so this is the meaning of. Flying up to the star and disappearing under the soil to walk under the earth. Yes. So you heard the story of the monkey go to the west. Sun Wukong. Yeah, he could fly to the star, and he could uh, run under the earth any time he want to disappear. It could be similar story. This person. Has not reached the complete enlightenment, but he could go visit places like that already. Yes, but even though he has attained so much power like that, you know, visit hell, visit heaven any time, he still has to pay homage to Xuan Zhuang. Even though Xuan Zhuang doesn't have so much magical power like he does. The reason is Xuan Zhuang was destined to be a master, and he is above all this uh, smaller level. You know, like go to the astral level, come back, and all that stuff. Yes, so that's what it meant. So let's go back to Lao Tzu. So when Lao Tzu departed from Taoling, he gave him a scroll of talismans. That had the power to heal the sick, and a magic sword that could drive away bad spirits. What does that mean? Huh? Does he really give him something? No, he might. He might have given him an instruction、uh, for initiation. Yeah, so he can heal the sick. And drive away the evil spirit. You know, the evil spirit doesn't necessarily mean a spirit. It means maybe something bad, the negative power. You know, that harm human and animals, and who are good and innocent people. Yes. So he gave him the power to give initiation. Therefore, you heard that Jesus healed the sick. Yeah, and、uh, and cure the blind. 
Yeah? Uh-huh. You heard the same thing about your master. <laughs> Heal the sick and cure the blind. Remember? Everywhere you go, you hear that from the disciples or from outside of people, even from the people who are not even initiated. So that means he uh, endowed him with the power to be uh, an initiated agent for the power of the Most High, of, you know, power of divine. All right. <laughs> the swirl they could drive away malevolent spirit. That means the wisdom, yeah? The time of initiation when uh, you are imparted with this power yes, is similar to the sword that cut asunder all the things that has been uh, ailing you, that has been troubling you, that has been attached to you and giving you trouble and obstructions in your life and uh, make you separated from the Tao. Yeah? Okay, that is the sword. The sword of Manchusri, uh, the sword of wisdom. That doesn't mean a physical cutting knife. Yeah? You know that by now already, right? Yeah, you are so smart. I am proud of you. <laughs> but of course, when people heard like that, they would imagine, oh, okay, uh, Chang Tao Ling now have a sword, yeah? And cut the bad uh, spirit, you know, the the ghost and all that. How can you cut the ghost with the sword? He doesn't have a body. <laughs> you understand me? Uh, the spirits don't have the body. Huh? Yes. Okay, the power to heal the sick, it's the power like Jesus has. Yes? Uh, but he always uh, credited to his Father. And say, uh, you have faith in the Father and you are healed. Your faith has healed you. Yeah? He heals so many sick people. Uh, there's nothing new to us, yeah? You are initiated, and many of your sickness are healed also, but don't come for that. I told you many times. This is just by the way, I'm telling you because you know that, right? Good, okay. Very good. So now, as time went on, Tao Ling's skill in the art of magic mature. It's not magic. <laughs> it's not the magical power that he is mature in. You understand me? This is a power of the divine. But people don't understand it. Of course, when people come to him and the sick get healed, the blind can see, see in a vision, yeah? Sometimes even physical blindness can be cured also, remember? Some of us, yeah? Some of you, yeah? Remember? Yes. Okay, good. So now, because of that, you know, people think, oh, this guy, uh, he is a magician, he can heal the sick and cure the blind. But this is just not what he intended to do. He intended to uh, impart to the people the knowledge of the Tao. So now, Lao Tzu probably uh, has given him the, uh, the instruction, the authorization to initiate people. So now, before he met Lao Tzu, he was meditating and hearing the sound and seeing the light already. That meant he has been studying with someone who was a disciple of Lao Tzu. And then one day he has a chance to come and see the Master, yeah? Uh, many of you are initiated and then come see Master later, remember? Oh, same, right? Yes. Good, good. So now, you understood everything, right? It's so easy, huh? <laughs> no? <laughs> It's just like us, so it's so easy to understand. Okay. Now, he has been mature in the magical power, you know, the so-called magical power, because to the ordinary people who are not initiated by him, they would never understand anything else like uh, inner vision or heavenly abode or anything like that. They would only see that, okay, the people... Uh, uh, who initiated by him uh, suddenly became different, uh, more beautiful, or uh, healed, or uh, uh, can see and explaining that I see the vision inside and I see God, I see all that. And people would just think that's all he has, yeah? Heal the sick and cure the blind. Because he also don't dare, in any case, to say anything more to the outsider people, except the trusted one, the one who come to him for learning, the divine power, yeah? The power of yourself, the kingdom of God, the power of the Tao. 
So, so people can only see the outside, the outward manifestation of the Tao, which is not even a fraction of whatever you can have or whatever you can know if you are initiated by Him. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, you understood. Soon he could make himself invisible or change himself into any shape he wished. He could hear and see over great distances and could call down rain and snow. He could heal the sick and drive away evil spirits. You see, his fame spread far and wide and people called him the celestial teacher for they believed that he was an immortal from the celestial realm. Okay, now, doesn't this sound familiar to you? Yes. Ah, why? Why is it that he can go everywhere? There's no one who can Anybody who can explain this to me? Think about it, answer me later, okay? I'll see you later. Repeating my words is good, but realizing my words is better. Okay? Capito? Yes. Hmm. Are you happy? Yes. yes. Did you eat good? Yes. <laughs> you like it here? Yes. <laughs> you love your neighbor? Yes. <laughs> good. Who's your neighbor? <laughs> ah, <laughs> okay, okay, I know, I know. Good, good, good. Oh, okay, we continue with this story, hey? Yeah. Okay, remember, he could heal the sick and drive away any evil spirits. Uh, his fame spread far and wide, and people called him the celestial teacher, for they believed that he was an immortal from the celestial realm <laughs> uh, region, huh? Okay, fine. Now, let's see what else is here. When the six evil spirits uh, were wreaking havoc in Sichuan, Lao Tzu appeared to Chang Tao Ling and told him to return there to capture the spirits and bring them to judgment. Tao Ling secluded himself for 1,000 days to prepare for this encounter. Now, secluding himself, what does he do, secluding himself? Huh? Meditate in solitude. Yeah, meditate alone, or meditate maybe with a companion or some, but purely for reinforcing more of his powers. Since he has been walking around and... Uh, appearing everywhere <laughs> for initiation. <laughs> Maybe he has worn out, you know, some of his power. So this is a great job that he has to do, you see? The six evil spirits, like, conspired together to uh, make trouble for the people in Sichuan, huh? where he was uh, meditating before, remember? Yeah, so Lao Tzu told him to go back there and take care of the people. He prepared himself 1,000 days before he go out and encounter the evil spirit. When the six lords of evil heard that uh, Chang Tao Ling was preparing to fight them, they gathered a large army of ghosts, ghosts, uh, zombies and other evil creatures. Meanwhile, the immortal also made preparation. He selected a green mound outside the city of Chengdu and built a tower with an altar in the middle. On the altar, he placed objects of power, such as magical mirrors, bells and talismans. 
I think all this also symbolic, inside or outside, yes. Sometimes according to the law of the physic, physical law, maybe you can use some certain objects, yes, to transfer some power into it and reflect in uh, some positive energy so that the evil spirit will be uh, dissipated, yeah, will be driven away, yes. So now, it's just like uh, sometimes for dealing with certain negative power, yes, uh, the Master will also learn some kind of uh, like astral law, yeah, because these evil spirits mostly came from astral levels, yeah? And so in order to deal with them, sometimes even the enlightened master, he has to use something which, uh, according to the astral magical law, will work. Understand me? Yeah. As long as he doesn't harm anyone else, but just to drive the spirit away. Kapish? Yeah? Okay, now. So, uh, about 10 p.m., Chang Taoling ascended the tower and invoked the wind, the rain, and thunder to beat upon the army of the evil spirits. Probably nobody will see this. Nobody will see what's going on. Yeah? Only him. Yeah? Or maybe some people who specialize in this field who would see these ghosts and ghosts and, you know, zombie stuff. Hmm? Ordinary people will not be able to see what kind of battle is going on between the good and the evils, between the positive and the negative. Yeah? Okay? Probably somebody has seen this. That's why they have written the story. Yeah? Okay. But when we read it, when the outsiders who read it, who don't uh, practice spiritual or don't have the wisdom eye open or at least the astral uh, uh, knowledge open, then they won't understand. They think it's just a children's story, okay? It won't happen. Nothing like that would ever happen because they have never seen such thing like that. But I tell you these things do happen. Nah? Nah. Sometimes without the the eyes of the mortal recognizing it. Because it, it is in the invisible realm, in the astral atmosphere, yeah? And when the astral people come here, they don't always manifest into material form. They just use their original form. And then the normal people will not be able to see it. Understand, yeah? Yes. 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 At uh, 10 o'clock p.m., that's the time of the battle, okay? Chang Taoling ascended the tower and invoked the wind, the rain, the thunder to beat upon the army of the evil spirit. My God, my God, what an evil spirit. He also drew talismans of power. You see, talismans of power, though maybe invisible, yeah? It's the way of speaking. Maybe he has a talisman, but invisible to the other people's eyes. Maybe he also has some symbolic things in his hands, yeah? Okay. And, and called on the celestial deities to fight the evil forces. Yes. The lords of evil sent flaming spears and arrows to hit Chang Taoling. But none of them could harm him. Phew, scary, huh? As the deadly missiles flew toward him, he waved his swords of power, and they were transformed into lotus flower. Ah. Have you seen anything like that somewhere? No? Well, some Chinese people saw it. These things are abstract, but they do happen. These are invisible things, yeah? If you listen to some of the CD or DVD of old time when I was in Taiwan, yeah, some Chinese recount some of that. Uh, yes. Some people might have seen it, but not all, yes? And sometimes when you see, like, a big typhoon and all that stuff, it's not necessarily 
a natural phenomenon. You understand me? Yes. When it's too devastating, these are the working of the negative powers. But the thing is, sometimes the negative powers also succeed in destroying some things right? because of people by karma. And sometimes the positive power has to also give in uh, as a fair play. You understand me? Uh, they cannot exceed more than what they should do. Yeah? Mm. Well, sometimes they do, but then the people, bad karma is still such a force. So that force is even helping the negative power. You know what I mean? Without people knowing it. It's like putting petrol into fire. The lords of evil then sent an army of hungry ghosts to attack Chang Taoling. But when they reached the outer, you know, when the, the hungry ghosts Reach the altar, want to attack Chang Taoling. The immortal drew a talisman, and all the ghosts fell on their knees and begged for compassion. Next, the six evil lords sent an army of ghosts, vampires, oh my god, and zombies to attack Chang Taoling. When these creatures came near the altar, he rang his magical bells, and the undead clutched their ears and fell to the ground, never to rise again. It's too loud for them. <laughs> they cannot bear. It's just uh, the bells, you know, the inside bells, such a strong power that the ghosts cannot bear. Yeah. Seeing their mission had failed, the Lord of Evil came forward themselves to attack Chang Taoling, who grasped his sword and drew the great seal of power. The sword emitted a stream of bright light, tell you, that was transformed into a net. The net descended over the six evil spirits and form a cage around them. Oh. Then the evil ones saw their captor striding toward them with his word of power. Mm. They beg at this time. They beg for mercy and forgiveness. Tao Ling said to them, you have brought illness and suffering to countless of people, and for these evil deeds you must be punished. But as the celestial way is compassionate, I will not kill you. However, I will punish you by keeping you locked inside the depths of a mountain. In this way, you will not harm people again. You see that? Even forgiveness has some uh, limit. Forgiving is fine, but uh, this kind of evil force cannot always let them run around making trouble for people for no reason. huh? Mm. So when the people saw that the sick lords of evil had been captured, they went to thank Chang Taoling and asked him to teach them his magic. He did not want to turn them away, so he told them to organize themselves into groups to help people who were in need. He also told them that uh, the most effective way to fight evil was to do good deeds. If everyone did only what is good, then evil could 
not take hold. To his close followers, Chang Daoling taught the magic of talisman. Talisman is protection, yeah? Some protective uh, measurement. It's not necessary an object or something or like uh, something to wear, <laughs> not necessary like that. So he teach them the magic of talismans and told them to always use them and use the power of, uh, of this magic for good, never for evil. On the day he ascended to the celestial realm, he left the sword of power and the great seal to his son and trusted him to teach and lead the followers of the celestial teacher's way. I just give him the mantle of successor so that he can continue his way. That's what it is. You remember, huh? You have to keep the five precepts, even though you have great power. You've been initiated and you know that many things happen according to what you wish even. But still, we have to keep it within the limit of moral standard and virtues. We cannot use this power to anything that is no good. Yeah? Even if you do that, you will be punished many folds by the Lord, Lord of Karma. Mm. It's similar to us, eh? Yeah, similar that we have to fight evil with good deeds. Yes. All right, the story finished, and thank you. Now I think you should meditate, okay? Yes. And if you have to go home, uh, go in peace, okay? And go with God's love. Continue whatever good deed you're doing and will be doing, and more all the time, yeah? Lean on virtue. Use virtue as your pillow. Hmm? Use God power as your protection. Yes. Light and sound as the nourishment for your soul. That's it. Okay? Yeah. I love you. Okay, we meditate now. time for my family. You are my family. All of you my family. The whole world is my family. Sorry I couldn't come earlier. I had so much office work waiting. My dogs, my boy, usually we spend a lot of time together, sleeping together, hug, hug and all that. And now, you know, I have very little time. No time for napping together and all that. So whenever I'm home, you know, a lot of love, you know, oh, playing around together. They snacking a lot, and they get fat, and then I go, and then they come back. <laughs> they lost some weight, and I come back and get fat again. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I take all my office work, you know, and I sit uh, together in the kitchen, and I'm working, and they're playing, and they watch TV, and I'm now and again they come and snuggle, snuggle, and I pat, pat, and they continue work, work, you know, one hand work, one hand pat, pat, and they take turn to come. I'm very polite. <laughs> 
when one had had enough, you know, or the other one pressing behind, say, come on, get over it, you know. <laughs> You've been there too long, man. It's a long queue here. And then he run, even though he still want to stay. I know that. Also, they take turn to come, and then I work in one hand, and another hand, I pet them. And they're also okay, yeah. Just the birds are more difficult, you know. Dogs are more natural. They run around you all the time. Birds are more difficult. Yeah, one sister of yours, she says she's kind of a little vex that uh, every Sunday she doesn't see my dogs and my birds. She hear them when I'm cooking, the cooking show, you know, and she wants to watch it every Sunday. Breakfast time with me and dogs and birds all together, my goodness. And then she thinks I can have like ten hands, you know. <laughs> it's The dogs may be okay, yeah. But the birds are not, because if I put them in the kitchen, sometimes they're frightened of something. They're flying to the soup. <laughs> oh, it's not funny, is it? <laughs> you know, we can laugh when it didn't happen, but if it happens, it's terrible. So she doesn't know what life I have. My goodness, look like every Sunday, Saturday, I sit there with her here, dog there, and then cook for her at the same time. <laughs> My goodness. I don't mind. <laughs> I'm happy to do the work. It's just we have only 24 hours, yeah? Ah, okay. You know, normally we just at home, just like you at home, quickie, you know? Mm-hmm. Mostly we, we save time for doing other things, yeah? When we have time, then we cook. When don't have time, then just sesame, brown rice, standard. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple. Yeah, and we warm some tofu or salad, whatever, or don't eat even, yeah? It's very simple. You try that. If you have time, you cook, elaborate. If you don't have time, sesame, brown rice, salad, fruit. Yeah, and you have tofu handy or veggie ham, something, you warm it up. We don't even need to wash too much, huh? Just put everything in a pot, huh? Like a, a stool style, you know? Put it in there and then and it cook. I taste just as good, just as good, huh? Ah. My secret, <laughs> the secret of a good cook. <laughs> and we don't live to eat, no? Or do we? <laughs> Here, yeah, huh? I told you only in case you're busy, no? Nah? Yeah, and it's still okay. As long as you have some fresh salads, fresh fruit to accompany with it, you know, and some rice, that's all you need, or bread. My dogs also eat like that. They love it. No problem. They don't mind. Whatever. Yeah. They're very simple. Just have to feed by hand. I said. <laughs> they don't ask for much. You, know? <laughs> you have nine dogs and feed one by one by hand. Imagine. No, they didn't ask for much. <laughs> Just joke. That's why all my attendants are busy. Every time, where is the A? She's busy <laughs> with dogs. Where is B? Uh, with the birds. <laughs> where is C? I uh, went out shopping for dogs. <laughs> we don't have enough dog food or <laughs> we run out of nuts for birds, something like that, you know, anything, anything. Yeah. It's okay. Fine. Okay. You remember yesterday we talked about uh, Taoism? Yeah. And the founder of Taoism seemed to be Lao Tzu, huh? Yes. Oh, okay. In Vietnam, we also say Dao Lao. That means Laoism. Laoism is the equivalent of Taoism, okay? I, I told you, after Lao Tzu died, they called himself Laoism, no? <laughs> and Christ died, they called himself Christian, huh? Mohammedan, Buddhist, yeah, you know already, by now. All right. Okay. So today, I'll tell you a little story about Lao Tzu, since you want to know uh, why. Why is he... An old man and then become a young young boy and all that. This is the thing with the, with the enlightened person, you know? They can be anywhere, anytime. They don't have to be old yet to become a master. Eh? According to legend of China, Lao Tzu, the name Lao Tzu means old kid. <laughs> also mean old man, eh? like Kung Fu Tzu, yeah? mean old teacher. Kung Fu to mean a, a master Kung. Huh? Legend had it that he was in his mother womb for like 70 years, and then, and then he's born. Yeah, that's why they call him Lao Tzu, you know, oh baby. <laughs> okay, so these two words are the same. Either Tzu as a teacher or Tzu as a, a kid. You know, a child. So maybe 
because he's so old and he's still a kid, so they call him Lao Zi, mean old kid. Huh? Okay, I guess, no? I guess. Now, the legend had it that he was staying in his mother's womb for 70 years plus and then come out, okay? That probably explained why yesterday, remember the guy met Lao Tzu as an old man that came to his town, remember? And then he said, oh, later, so and so years, you come back to such and such town and you find a blue, blue ox. And then once he found the blue ox, what did he find also? Young. A little kid. Yeah, yeah a young master, remember? He said, my young master loved this blue ox very much. That young master is just a kid, but because he's uh, working for that family, so they call him also master, eh? Yeah. So I'm not the only master, so don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the name is, doesn't matter, the name. All right, so now, maybe even before he was born, he was already a master. And I go in there just for the purpose of teaching his uh, first disciple, yeah? and then he disappeared. Yeah, he just appeared to go there for a while to teach him. Meanwhile, he was still in the celestial realm. He has not come down to reincarnate yet. You see what I mean? Ah, that's why he says, and so and so year, and you go to Sichuan and look for a blue ox. And because he would know at that time he will be reincarnated again. See what I mean? Or oh, maybe at that time he is already old, yeah, and he taught his only and first disciple, and then he left the physical world, and then he knew at what time, what day he would be reborn again, and where and where. So he told his disciple, go there, you meet me again. Yeah. But when he came there, he saw a little kid. But then a little kid transformed into an old man. Perhaps that's why they call him Lao Tzu. Yeah, a little old kid. <laughs> because his name actually is Li Er, you know? Okay, so his name is Li Er, and the Er sometimes is uh, sound like little baby also, or a child. But I ask them whether that character is written as a child or as a ear, so they say it's an ear. <laughs> yeah, I mean your ear, ear, yeah, and me uh, er mean little kid, yeah, or my child, my daughter, er mean child, yeah. So they say it's uh, written as an ear. I say, oh my God, it's not very nice name, <laughs> <laughs> but I say I guess maybe because he practice quoning method, so they mention the ears <laughs> for the sound, you know, <laughs> maybe. It's destined to, to learn or to teach quantum method, so his name is already earmarked like that. <laughs> so that we don't mistake, okay? So people don't mistake at that time. So his name is Lao Tzu, you know? Perhaps because of that event, yeah? Maybe because of that transformation in his house when his first disciple came, yeah? Suddenly he transformed himself into... Uh, an old man. I don't think it is physical. Yeah. I think it is more metaphysical. Yeah. Uh, perhaps uh, his disciple, as well as other people around, can also see it at the same time. So they witnessed it, and so they changed his name, become a little old kid. <laughs> yes, I guess that's what it is. They think that he has been in his mother womb all this time for 70 years and now he just came out because otherwise how would Wen Shi have uh, known this man long ago when he was 70 years old you see what I mean yeah or 60 something at that time so they uh, put two and two and they make it four <laughs> but this two and that two doesn't make four and never mind <laughs> I mean, the, the worldly people, they can never explain this, yes? So they would just say that he has been in his mother womb all this time. <laughs> and then he manifests himself uh, into the, uh, the old man over there and teach this guy, and then come back to his mother womb and stay in there, and then just come out recently, something like that. That's why the legends say that he stayed in his mother womb for 70-some years. Okay.
That's that. That explains his name, and that explains also yesterday the story why the disciple came and then the old man became the, the little kid, and then the little kid transformed again into an old man, etc., etc. Oh, they're really confusing us. <laughs> Never mind, it's just a story. It's just a bedtime story. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, here the story say that Lao Tzu originally name was Li Er. Yes. The legend say that on the night he was conceived, his mother saw an infant wrapped up by the sun, the moon, and the clouds. On the morning of his birth, three suns rose from the east, and after his suckle, magic water came out of the mouth of nine dragons. Don't ask me. <laughs> and don't look at me. <laughs> I am wondering, just like you. <laughs> I'm wondering, what is it all about? That's one impressive thing. Very impressive. <laughs> just like the Buddha, you know, when he was born, there's seven lotus, you know, uh, bloom under his feet and he walk on it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no need midwife, nothing. He come out by himself <laughs> and he walks you. <laughs> that is also impressive baby. We have some impressive baby in the East. I don't know, we didn't hear such thing in the West, huh? <laughs> okay. Even in the West, if people have such story, they would not write it. You know, they think, ah, oh, it's nonsense, <laughs> no such thing. The Eastern people, they, you know, more diligent. They write out whatever happened, huh? And you believe it or not, it's your problem. <laughs> Why not, eh? Yeah, you just tell the truth. People believe or not believe. Doesn't matter, right? Mm. Water came out of the months of nine dragons. Oh, I don't know that nine dragons, where it is, but the three suns rose from the east. Ah, it's similar to Jesus Christ's birth, eh? The bright star that uh, appeared from the east, right? Also from the east. I have everything from the east. And then have led three wise men all the way to the mango where Jesus was to pay homage to him and offer something for comfort for the Son of God. And similar here are the three sons rose from the east, and after his circle, magic came out of the mouth of nine dragons. Probably there were nine dragons, a statue or some sort at the time, or there was a river called Nine Dragon. Yeah? And perhaps there were nine dragons in that river, so they call it Nine Dragons. Or maybe it resembles Nine Dragons, you know? Yeah. And people believe in the East that dragons are the ones who make water, who make rain and all that. Mm. So this is just maybe symbolic talk, huh? or maybe someone who has practiced as spiritual and saw something happening like that. Yes. The three three suns rose from the east. This you have to take it with a pinch of candy. <laughs> you understand me? <laughs> now, what they probably meant was that someone is meditating. Yeah and saw the sun. You know, just like when you meditate, you saw the sun inside. And it's a three suns or four suns or sometimes even thousand suns, yeah? the, the brightness of it, like that. Probably when he's born, uh, the whole earth is very happy, the universe celebrates, you know? Yeah. So some practitioner take this energy and also see something, you know, like three suns from the east or nine dragons with plenty of water. That means uh, very abundance in it, so, so the people. Because in the old time, people relying on rains and river water, much of the time relying on rain. Eh? And then, uh, so if people see something like the water come out of the nine dragons, yes, or the, uh, the sun rise, something like that, this is a very auspicious omen. Yeah, the water come out of the nine dragons' mouth, then that means they have a lot of water. They're going to have a lot of harvest, good harvest. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's a symbol of good luck. Ah, all right. 
Okay, continue with Leo's life. Leo was a very um, exceptional child. He's not normal. At three, his body radiated a golden glow, you know, the aura, golden aura, already at three years old. At five, he gazed at the sun and smiled and looked at the moon and sighed. <laughs> Probably he was a solarian and moonarian, yeah, trying to get the uh, energy from the sun to sustain himself more than ordinary mean of food, you know, the extra, extra. At seven, he learned to swallow the rays of the sun, the moon, and the stars. He swallowed them. <laughs> he eat them? No, but perhaps he has learned the art of taking prana from natural phenomena, yeah, from natural bodies in the celestial realm, in the, in the firmament, yes. Just like nowadays some people live from the sun, yeah, sun rays, and uh, from everything that they, they take in, you know? We saw on TV the man who eats only sun, who lives from the sun, yeah? And he drinks just a little water every day, remember? Uh. And this is a true story, you know, like in the Yogananda biography, he also recounts many people who, who doesn't eat normal food, but live from air or sun, or what they call prana, you know, the chi. In Chinese they call it chi. The chi is everywhere, from the ground you walk, to the air around you, from the trees, forest. Yeah, especially in the forest and mountain, the chi are purer than normal here. Yeah. There was one person, a woman from the West, I mean the Occidental people, and she, she also tried to live on air like that. And she say whenever she's up in a mountain or somewhere like remote area, she can sustain the non, non-eating state. Yeah, long time, longer. But whenever she went down back into the city, she cannot hold it very well. Perhaps the air, the chi, you know, in the atmosphere in the mountain and the forest is more conducive for some, for, for some people, yeah. Some people, they can just live anywhere and also live on air as well. Yogananda, he has uh, told us the story of uh, Teresa Neumann in Germany. Yes, that has been proven even by doctors that she never ate. She just uh, swallowed a piece of waffle thin, you know, like paper. Like piece of paper, like you know those uh, they're consecrated in the church. They give you waffle uh, cake, very thin, like a paper, like a piece of this paper. Yeah, and she swallowed that every day, as a ritual of a nun. You know, that's it, and nothing else. And she lived like that until she is gone. I myself, I told you already that I knew also one nun in Taiwan. Eh? She lived until sixty something. And she has never eaten anything since a long time, many, many years. Maybe since her thirty or something. Yes. Since she became a nun and then she just don't eat. But she drinks a little bit of water that uh, consecrated by the compassion mantra. That is supposed to be the mantra from Guanin Bodhisattva. Yeah. So every day they, they, they do this uh, ritual, you know, like in the church you get up and and you pray and sing song, yeah, praising God. So a Buddhist temple also in the morning you wake up, you sing uh, the sutra and the mantra and the old text, yeah, and then uh, and then consecrate the water by that, bless the water by that, and then she drink a little bit like that every day. She really doesn't eat anything. <laughs> so this thing happened, hey? Yeah. So perhaps Lao Tzu, when he was young, he already began to learn the art of a solarian, breatharian, manarian, you know, waterian, whatever, yeah. So in case you don't have any food, don't, don't panic, just remember. Remember you have uh, the source of all sustenance within you. Just call on to that force to sustain you, that's it, really simple. And continue your Kuan Yin practice. 
in that case, we save a lot of more time. Also, what's wrong with it? You know, I mean, don't have to panic. Right? No need to wash dishes. No need to go shopping. Nothing. So, don't panic. Okay. Don't worry about food shortage. Don't worry about water shortage. Don't worry even about the end of the world. We are doing uh, things like informing people, vegetarian, all that, all because of compassion. Yeah, or because we want people to awaken within themselves their own noble nature, their own compassion, and their own loving great self again. That's all, okay? So don't worry about dying or have no food. If you have no food, you pray, okay, to the inner divine self, which provides things for everything on earth and all the whole the universe. Yeah, the air also provided by that source. Yeah, the water also manifested by that source. We also are manifested by that loving source, which we have within ourselves, the source of all life. So we don't worry about that, okay? If we have food, we eat. If we don't have, then we don't eat. Have a simple philosophy. <laughs> and if we don't have water, same, same philosophy, okay? Don't drink. <laughs> but uh, as we work harder, like the way you do, Yes, you go out and distribute flyer and all that. Then uh, we will have uh, more food, more water, plenty, don't worry, okay? And if not, then I told you already. Don't say that I did not tell you. Huh? The source of food, the source of sustenance, the source of life is within you. Call on that source any time you need, okay? Understand? Don't worry about anything at all. We don't need to worry about what choice we should make, right? Very simple, straightforward, right in front of your nose. <laughs> I told you in the beginning already, since the time I met you, that life is very dangerous. It ends always deadly. <laughs> there is such a game like that, no? Nah? Okay? Some people, they go do some very dangerous game, you know? Like jumping with parachute from the cliff, and um, six people, but only five parachute, and the other one have no parachute. So they they risk their lives just to see who who die. Can you believe that? Oh, why is there such a spot like that? I just want to show them macho. Why so hurry like that? At the end, we die anyway, huh? <laughs> no need jumping rope, no. <laughs> you know that spot, right? Some place it exists. Yeah, well, a secret, but I'm telling only you. <laughs> no, I read it on newspapers. Some people are bored, so bored, they have to <laughs> go out and find something exciting and suspense to do, you know? Because they know, all of them know, that one of uh, the, the bag has no parachute in it. So when you open it, you just fall down. You know what I mean? And other five will have a parachute. One of the bag is just no parachute. It just uh, looks like, but there's nothing in it. So you, you, you pick your choice. It's your problem, you know? You don't have to. <laughs> and they sign the name, okay, I'm willing to die in case. Uh, something like that. Huh? Oh, look at her face. <laughs> it's not you, why worry? <laughs> I hope you don't choose that. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, some people choose to die like that, some people choose to die in different way. Try again till these ten come up. <laughs> who? Who turn? Well, these five people try. <laughs> no, 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 it's not that. They all jump together at one time. Oh, right. Yeah, and they take whatever assigned to them. And the person assigned also doesn't know which one. You know, this is kind of a lotto, <laughs> uh, gambling with your own life. Some people like it like that. Maybe they bet with each other. Or maybe they just want to die, they don't have excuse, so I do that just in case they die naturally, it's easy. <laughs> well, people have their choice, okay? Mm. Now, we go back to the uh, Lao Tzu, huh? Lao Tzu. He's not uh, ever interested in becoming uh, an official in the court of the king. He doesn't want to really work for the government. So, he went to the a library, to work at the librarian. Uh, there he can read a lot of ancient texts and study uh, the Tao, <laughs> the Dharma, yes. You must know only the imperial library have it. Imperial library, they have all kinds of books, rare books, yeah? Old textbooks from 
maybe different scriptures from the old time, a rare collection, yes. So if he works there, he had access to all these rare texts and he can study to his heart content. If he's a poor man, he could never afford so many books. You know, he cannot buy all that himself. Even if he has money, he cannot buy all that. Yeah, the king has priority, you see, put in a library like that. And you must know in those times to to have a book is, is something of the great possession, eh? because they don't use machine like nowadays to print text. They carve alphabet, they carve words, words into uh, stone tablets or wood, yeah? And so they do it one by one like this. So the process of printing is uh, very <laughs> laborious. And if uh, you want the book, I guess you have to wait for a long time, yeah? Therefore, if you can uh, have access to the imperial library, that is very lucky and it's wonderful. So he loved to study those anyway. So he worked there. At that time, the lord of that uh, area is uh, Liu An, yeah? And uh, he has a palace, of course. And one day, eight people, eight old men, nah, went to this palace and asked for an audience with this lord, the prince, maybe one of the prince. You know, a prince but it's like a lord of the region, you know? It's not like prince in the palace, uh, son of the king. It's not necessary like that. When you're an aristocrat, you can also be called prince, and then you own your estate somewhere, like in a castle and something like that. So a man, all very old men, appear in front of this uh, castle and ask for an audience with the prince, Liu An. The guards at the castle look at them with uh, this kind of eyes, you know, maybe half eyes, only one eye. <laughs> I don't know how, but it seems like not a very normal eyes here, you know, as the way it's written, and said to them, you want to see our Lord, huh? Uh, you better have something to offer him, do you? So they say, what, what is your Lord <laughs> desire? So they say, okay, there are three things that uh, our Lord, you know, they call, is uh, very interested in. The first thing that uh, he liked to learn, the art of longevity. The second thing is he wants to meet the scholars of uh, extraordinary status, yes, yeah, scholars, well-learned scholars. The third, he would like to recruit retainers who are experts in the martial arts. I mean, those kung fu master, eh? All right. You are all old and weak. <laughs> I told you they look with different eyes, didn't I? You are old and weak. What can you offer to our Lord that you come here bothering us? <laughs> when the A.O. men heard this challenge, they laughed, laughed and laughed, and they said, We have heard that the prince, <laughs> <laughs> the prince of Wainan is a generous man <laughs> and does not judge people by appearances. However, if you think that your master will only receive those who are young and able, then we will be glad to oblige him also. Yeah. Oh, there are hidden muscles somewhere, huh? <laughs> Immediately, the eight old men transformed themselves into handsome, strong, tall youths. Wow, I'd like to see that happen one day <laughs> in front of my eyes. <laughs> Remember the joke I told you? A little naughty joke? No? In the church, the pastor said to his congregation that today the church especially needs uh, extra money. If anybody uh, who give like $3,000 into the plate, can can choose three him for that day. So the old woman right in front of you, three thousand dollars. <laughs> and then the the pastor asked her to come up and say, Okay, now you can choose three hymns. 
and he said, I run him, I run him, and I run him. <laughs> the three handsome him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she should have come and learn with this amen. <laughs> okay. Oh, immediately the guard knelt on the floor, begged for forgiveness, and ran to inform their master at once that their eight immortals had arrived at their gate. Yeah. Liu An quickly went out and to welcome the visitors, and who by then had transformed back into old men already. <laughs> old men, aren't they busy? Huh? Why don't just give one form, huh? And transform back and forth, back and forth. Uh, confusing us. All right. The prince also knelt down on the floor, bowed to the men and said to them, It is an honor for me to receive such distinguished guests. So that night, Liu An prepared a big feast to honor the eight Taoists. During the dinner, one of the old men stood up and said to the prince, We see that you are sincere in your pursuit of the Tao. Each of us has a specialty that he can teach you. One of us can command the elements make rain and change the course of rivers. Another can move mountains, tame wild beasts, and summon spirits and ghosts. Poof. Are you interested? <laughs> huh? Me neither. <laughs> Nowadays we just use uh, the cat, the bobcat, right? <laughs> The crane? <laughs> Simple move mountain. Another can hide the movement of armies and make them appear at different places at the same time. Interested? No, we don't want war anyway. Another cannot be harmed by fire, water, or weapons. Weapons. Another can create and craft anything he wants animals, plants, or inanimate objects. Another still can see impending disasters and is skilled in the art of longevity and immortality. Wow. Interested? No? Okay. Good boy. Good girl. <laughs> Another can transform dirt into gold and lead into silver. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> if I had no one like that, we could tell him transform this place into a bigger place. Or transform all this pepper into gold, and then we can buy a bigger place. <laughs> yeah, then all of you can stay forever. Every day just transform in pepper and go out shopping. <laughs> we don't need to work anymore, right? <laughs> we use the pepper to buy tickets and send you all over the place to inform people about vegetarian diet and then come back in no time. Hmm? I need somebody who also can manifest aeroplane <laughs> or UFO. I will come and go, come and go. Eh? Okay. Another still can fly in the sky and tunnel beneath the earth. Ah, this is typical of those uh, magical power at that time. Hmm? Yes. They talk about flying in the sky and, and tunnel under the, the earth. They love those stuff. Yeah. Of these skills, which one would you like to learn? Your yeah. Highness. So Liu An, the prince, replied to them, All I wish is to be able to predict catastrophe and live a happy and long life. Oh, he didn't want much, huh? What would you like to learn? You say all of them, right? <laughs> How can you learn them all? Even eight of them, each one only can master one kind of art, and not all of them. You know why? It takes a long time to learn those things. I just go out, pay a few hundred dollars, and then get the 
<laughs> Bobcat <laughs> and the crane, and then they do it fast. <laughs> All this you take long time to learn. You understand? Years and years of practice. And have to continue all the time, otherwise you forget. You lost the power. So Liu An spent nine years, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Liu and the prince spent nine years learning from the old man and eventually succeeded in making the pill of immortality. Where is he now? <laughs> you see what I mean? Uh, immortality, I, I guess, is is not uh, physical. Hey, yes, and all the things that they were talking about here, I guess, is also not physical either. Yeah, it's just like when we meditate, we feel like we fly in the air. Yeah, we do fly, and some of you when visit other planets and come back, tell me a lot of stuff, or some feel like you went in to the earth or went to hell, even visit somebody, your friend or whatever there, <laughs> and came back, yeah? So, and some also can move mountain and move the rivers and all that stuff. These things do happen without you even doing anything. If you're a practitioner, in the time of need, any miracle can happen to protect you or to help you in a special situation. Huh? when you need it, when you truly need it. All right. So uh, he succeeded in making the pill of immortality. I guess that means that he has transcended life and death. Yeah, he has learned the art of meditation, and uh, he became enlightened already, yeah? He will not be reborn again with the karmic burden. All right. So. However, on the day that he completed his, uh, his apprenticeship, his son was killed accidentally by one of the emperor's secretary during a sword fighting practice session. Oh, God. It is terrible. Fearing that the lord of Huainan, mean the prince, would sentence him to death, the secretary told the emperor that Liu An was plotting a rebellion. So, the lord of uh, Huainan is Liu An, yeah, the prince of that region as Liu An. But uh, his secretary killed his son by accident, and the secretary worried that Liu An would kill him. So he went to tell, of course, the emperor of the country that Liu An is uh, plotting some coup d'etat, yeah, instead, so that the emperor will go and capture Liu An and family instead, so Liu An cannot kill him, you see? Oh, terrible, man. That evening, the emperor issued an order to arrest Liu An, of course, and uh, the old man said to the prince, you should leave the palace immediately before the emperor sent some guard to capture him. The old man already knew it. Yes, yes. So he said, this is a warning from heaven. If you tarry, you will be captured and executed. Liu An heeded the advice of his teacher immediately. Ha, ah, good boy, good boy. He didn't know why yet, you see what I mean? And the old man doesn't say nothing much. Just say, if you stay here, you will be captured and killed. Being a good disciple, he did not need explanation. Huh? Good disciple don't need explanation. They just listen to their master. Period. Right? Whatever the master say, they know it's correct. So he did not ask further. He immediately listened to his master and escaped. So he went to his laboratory, took a pill from the cauldron, <laughs> the immortality pill, and swallowed it. Yeah. So in his hurry to leave the palace, he knocked the cauldron onto his side and scattered the remaining little pills all over the floor. Before the pills could be picked up by the servants, they were eaten by the cats and the dogs in the household. <laughs> so you know what it's like, huh? Cat dog became enlightened, huh? <laughs> So when the emperor's soldiers arrived at Liu An's palace, 
he was nowhere to be found. The officer questioned the town's people, and they told him, Oh, we saw the Lord of Huainan, I mean the Prince Liu An, floating up in the sky with cats and dogs, <laughs> flying with him together <laughs> behind him. <laughs> it's a very funny story. Yeah. That is the end of the story. So now, do you think that Liu An really did cook up some potion in his kitchen huh? for Supreme Master Television show or something? <laughs> so what means by he came and took a pill in the cauldron, you know? Remember, they say that at that time he already succeed in cooking, making a pill of immortality. So what does that mean that he go and took some pill from the, the pot? What does it mean? I mean he really took some pill? He meditated. He meditated. Oh, okay. And then he escaped, huh? Probably escaped somewhere. But because he meditated, and during the meditation time, perhaps uh, people see his transformation body uh, fly up in the sky, you know? But at that time he probably was somewhere else already meditating, yeah? And of course his dogs and cats, if they're with him, they probably also fly in all over the place, yeah? <laughs> and people see that and they think, oh, they all fly up in the sky. And not necessarily they see that, but the people who meditate, you see? Maybe his uh, fellow practitioners, yeah, saw him there, and in the town where where the a immortal have come, probably they teach more than just the prince. You see, the prince would have let other people come and learn also, yeah? So the whole town probably, <laughs> mostly are practitioners. If something the prince learned, he would have shared it with others when it's such a good thing like that. You see what I mean? And he has the power, you see? He's the chief of the town. So, of course, he let everybody come. And, okay, come here and learn and get initiation and practice together. And Liu An probably was the one who got the the highest enlightenment first, or the complete enlightenment first, yeah? So at that time they say, oh, he, he has uh, <laughs> cooked up the pill already. <laughs> In the old time they have to talk like that. You know, you cannot talk about enlightenment, the Tao, and oh, that you get your head chopped off. <laughs> yeah, you know that, right? Even nowadays we still have to be careful where we, we say it, and it depends on which country. We cannot even say things openly. You know that, right? So you see, even when you practice the Kuan Yin method or meditation like this, if you are highly developed spiritually, your cat, your dogs also <laughs> get elevated. Huh? It's true like that. It's true like that. Yeah. Okay. So even uh, five or nine generations of yours also get helped. Yeah. Your dogs, your cats also. <laughs> Whoever you love, yeah, will be also elevated accordingly, according to your standard. If you are high, they are also high. If you are low, they are also low. <laughs> oh, too bad. <laughs> it's fair, no? Mm -hmm. All right. Good story, eh? Mm -hmm. All right. Good, good. That's it. Are you happy now? Yes. You also need to go home to work, okay? I mean, not just work, earn money, but work for the world, okay? Also, yes, huh? <laughs> Must earn money, right? But also work for the world, eh? Yeah. All right. Yilu Sun Fong, huh? Yilu Sun Fong. Have a good trip. I am so sorry you have to leave. I really am. I want to keep all of you, honestly. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> Who knows? If the world is safe, huh? Stabilized, huh? Or we catch one of those amen, huh? <laughs> who can transform dirt into gold, huh? And then we can buy the whole beach down there, huh? <laughs> buy all the hotels on the beach, huh? <laughs> okay, we uh, meditate then. Or oh, anything else? Meditate, okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, I sit with you, okay? Yeah, yeah all right, love.